Maybe no words can express what has happened. It is not my pen that can describe the horrors of genocide. But be that as it may, I am compelled to go on writing. It is in this writing, this testimony to the crime, this letter of indictment against the murderers, that I find the sole purpose of my survival. We would walk, our heads full of soot and ashes from the fires that had just finished consuming the city, the echo of the planes and explosions still ringing in our ears. These were the last days of September 1939. I was helpless, broken, desperate. On one of those days, I received word that Emmanuel Ringelblum was looking for me. Ringelblum sent me to Leshno 40. The building hadn't been destroyed, and we were able to establish a kitchen there. I was placed in a position that enabled me to observe events that according to Ringelblum's later instructions, I had to describe. I set off scrambling over the ruins. We wandered through apartments, looking for cooking utensils, plates, spoons, and food. That's how it began. On its first day of existence, our kitchen prepared 50 portions. Later on, we provided 2,000 meals a day. Help developed rapidly in a state of chaos, such that the number of those seeking help reached 40,000 by December 1939. At the end of spring, or maybe the beginning of summer, 1941, I'm once again invited to Ringelblum's apartment. The ghetto had been in existence for over six months. From Ringelblum, I hear about a group engaged in the documentation and collection of contemporary documents. This group has been active for a while, and Ringelblum asks me to join it. Naturally, I choose the kitchen as my subject. The kitchens were under tremendous strain, both from the malnourished workers and their families, and from the unemployed refugees and locals. Soup was their only form of daily sustenance. When I started working, I wanted to accommodate everyone. I had to withstand so many waves of hungry people. A public kitchen meant so many things. As time went on, it became an organizational unit for other activities, political activities, cultural activities, and later on, the uprising. I would write at night, because in the evening, after returning from a 12-hour workday, filled with painful experiences, I could not write. August 4th, 1941. Please give, throw us something, merciful Jews. These words ring in our ears incessantly. The words are intoned. The song of hunger, sung publicly in courtyards, in stairwells, those who will soon be found dead on the edges of sidewalks. They wander on swollen feet, their eyes searching. They ask for pity, crying and wailing, and lamenting the pain of hunger on the eve of their demise. It haunts each ghetto resident, even in their nightmares, a sort of choir recital, forever remaining engraved in the memory of those who will be fortunate enough to survive. April 16th, 1942. A week ago, I passed by the Gengshavka secondhand market. There is hardly an article which is not traded in Gengshavka. Some people remove the lining from their coats to sell it in the market to buy a quarter loaf of bread. But hunger cannot be driven away by a quarter loaf of bread. The stomach swallows everything, and the next morning calls for more. Eventually comes the turn of the last chair in the house, the last pair of shoes off one's feet. So many of those who came to our kitchen have disappeared. Entire families, Entire communities who were transferred to the ghetto passed through the soup kitchens 
and faded away in front of our very eyes. Unfortunately, we reached the conclusion that we were really only able to help those who had another source of income. No soup could have saved the neediest. The only outcome of our work was possibly this, preventing the whole ghetto from dying at once, regulating death. Then came the terrible July 22nd. The great deportation began in earnest. It was Wednesday, the eve of the 9th of Av, 1942, the Jewish day of mourning. Our kitchen on Leshno Street was still working on the first day of the roundups. They came in like a storm. Hundreds upon hundreds entered the kitchen hall. The fear didn't lessen their hunger. Filthy, lice-ridden, bloated, they sat at the tables. The full kitchen staff served them, also giving second helpings. It was a beggar's feast, the sight of which cannot be forgotten. Looking back today, after so many years, I believe it was hasty of me to underestimate the actual and former social significance of the communal soup kitchens network. It is thanks to the actions of this establishment, together with the spontaneous acts of smuggling and illegal trade, that two-thirds of the population of the Warsaw Ghetto were able to survive the first two and a half years of the war.